I was born on December 17, 1924. My parents named me Yukiko, or Child of Snow. Most people just called me Yuki. My younger brother Tomio and I were Nisei, the children of Issei immigrants. My father had been a publisher of a Japanese newspaper back in Vancouver. My mother was a koto player. We all used to live in a comfortable home in Vancouver's Japantown. On July 4, 1942, months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, my family left our home for the last time. I was 17 years old. Monday, July 6, our first day in Slocan City. It's practically a ghost town. Silver miners lived here once, a long time ago. We're in Bay Farm Camp, half a mile from the hotel sharing a 16 by 16 hut with another woman, Maria, and her twin babies, Bobby and Elsie, and Oji-san, her grandfather. Immediately on entering, there is a long, narrow table with two long benches that we share with Maria's family. Our kitchen is a wood stove and a basin on a stand for washing. We have two bunk beds for four people. Our things are stuffed in apple boxes. Clothes, towels, books. Tomio sleeps with his toy cars. My diary and pencil are under my scrunched up dress that I use for a pillow. If not for the partition in the center of each hut separating the beds, we wouldn't have any privacy at all. Before dad was taken away, he said he didn't think women and kids would have to leave. But if we did, he said we should only take what we could not part with. For us, the essentials were not just clothes and supplies, but also books and music. They were a daily part of our lives, and dad could not see us going without. Tomio's turning four. He drew a picture of our dog Skip with dots around the eyes. I stuck it on the wall with cooked rice for glue. He said Skippy was crying. Mostly he draws on the ground with a stick. For Mama and other Issei, everything is arigatai. We're alive, we're together, we're healthy. Thursday, December 17th. Dad made it to my birthday. His present was a poem he wrote for me. Mostly English, some Romaji. Mama said I should show Tomio how to color the Union Jack red, white, and blue. It's her way of saying, everything is fine. We are Canadians, and this is still our country. She's quite different from the other mothers. She tries hard to speak English. 
She and I read a child's garden of verses to Tomio every night. Dad was happy to see we'd brought the small record player. Every night before bed, he sits with his eyes closed and listens. I think he's pretending we're home. Maria's husband had a bad accident at his road camp. He's been in the hospital at New Denver for months. She spends a lot of time sitting on her bed, turning her wedding ring around her finger, the baby's crying and the laundry piling up. There are moments when I look at the mountains and it's so beautiful I could cry. Then I remember why we're here, and I do. I miss our home, my room, my desk, the artwork, the grandfather clock. It never occurred to me just how big our house was. Dad had a library full of Japanese books and encyclopedias. People came to hear Mama play her koto, and we put extra chairs in the living room. Our dining room wasn't used unless we had guests. It's not like we were rich. It was just a normal house. You don't realize what you take for granted until it's gone. August 24th. 1943. A few people arrived today. I searched for Vancouver friends as they piled out of the truck. Most were strangers. The Issei just looked matter of fact as usual, no matter what. One little boy looked afraid. Then guess what? Talk. Talk to Naka. He jumped off and didn't look afraid at all. Tuck's family left Vancouver before ours, but I had no idea where they'd gone. I was so surprised I could hardly speak, and my cheeks got hot when he waved at me. I've always known him through church. He's good looking. One time, when I was singing a solo and playing the piano, he was looking at me seriously. And when I noticed, he grinned and winked. I do like Tuck. He's funny and sincere. I was wondering if I'd ever see him again when all this happened. We've settled into a routine. It's over a year without education, and now I'm teaching at the newly built Pine Crescent School. Tuck got a job in the grocery store, and he helps me teach little kids how to read. There wouldn't be a school, or a kindergarten, or bathhouses, or outhouses, or anything if it weren't for the shipbuilders. Their tools built everything, even the square wash basins. Some of my students have chosen English names and won't use their Japanese ones, like Aiko Suzuki, for example. She goes by Geraldine now. The children are hiding their Japanese-ness. That's what it takes to protect themselves. During lunch, I see them wanting to trade rice balls for peanut butter sandwiches. The one place we can truly be ourselves is the bathhouse. Men on one side, women on the other. When Tomio was four, he went on either side, but now he goes with dad and talk no Ji-san. 
We come several times a week with our basins, soap, and washcloth. People are generally polite and try not to be the first ones in. I like the feel of the pumice stone Mama brought from Japan. It's light and porous, perfect for calluses. The water is scalding hot. Once we're submerged up to our necks, worries lift off like steam. It's the best thing. We talk and swap gossip, or we say nothing, and everything is okay. The missionaries came with us and live in a big house. Miss Foster, Miss Heaps. Grace Tucker is small like us. She used to take koto lessons from Mama. She's working day and night with politicians like Andrew Bruin in Ottawa. She's noble and gentle and aristocratic and funny and works her heart out fighting for us. We'll always love her. We'll never forget her. We may be cut off from the world, but news travels. We know how the country sees us. The signs in Vancouver told us we were hated. Since we've been here, nothing has changed. The newspapers tell us so. Politicians say so. Movies play in the Odd Fellows Hall. Newsreels are first. We're desperate for word of the war, for any sign that it will ever be over. We all just want to go home. News from the war in Asia is unbearable. I saw a Japanese soldier beheading a prisoner who was kneeling in front of him, right before my eyes. I covered my face. I felt like screaming and running out of the hall and out of the camp and out of the world. Canada says we're Japs, but we're not. We're not. I had a fight with Tuck. He said that the government sold our houses, so even if the war ended, we couldn't go home. I don't believe it. And then, just as I got up to march out, Tuck reached for my arm and said, whatever happens, he just wanted to be with me. He asked me to marry him. Dad says I'm too young. Mama said nothing. Tomio said, you can't go away, Yuki. I said, I'm your sister forever, Tomio, even if I get married. Maria just clapped her hands. I told Dad, I'm a Canadian, and he and Ojisa nodded. Tuck and I are married. It was a quiet, lovely ceremony. Harry Aoki, Tuck's oldest friend, came to see us on his way to Alberta. He played his harmonica for us. It's not how I envisioned a wedding when I was a little girl, but it was beautiful. We had it in the Anglican church in Slocan. Mama made me a new dress. Dad traded some books for the cloth. It's simple, and tomorrow I will wear it as I go to get water. But today, it is my wedding dress, and I cannot love it more. Tuck shares my bunk bed. Tomio keeps peeking at us. Privacy? What's that?
Monday, September 24th, 1945. It's been three weeks since Japan surrendered. It's true. All of it. The government did sell our homes, and businesses, the fishing boats, everything. The war is ended. Democracy is ended too. We're being urged to sign away our lives. Either go to Japan or go east of the Rockies. Deportation or dispersal, that's the choice. Cities and towns are closing their doors to us. Dad says we shouldn't stay in a country that hates us. Families are being torn apart. None of us are going home. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. <laughs>